And I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening. <clears throat> Randy Ellickson is, has received his bachelor's degree in physics at Carleton College, Northfield, Minnesota in 1987 and his MS and his PhD degrees in applied physics from Cornell University, Ithaca, New York in 1990 and 1994, respectively. He served as a postdoctoral researcher and senior scientist with the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado from 94 to 2008. He is a professor of physics and member of the Wright Center for Voltaics Innovation and Commercial commercialization at the University of Toledo. He, the center focuses on advancing the understanding, performance, and commercialization of photovoltaic materials and technologies. <clears throat> he has just recently uh, received a $2.12.5 million grant to continue his work at the University of Toledo. So we are very proud to have him here. He was to be our speaker a year ago, and because of the coronavirus, and we didn't have Zoom at that time, he was unable to do it. So he's here tonight, thank God. So Randy, welcome to the SAVE lecture series. Thank you very much, um, Sister Rosine and John and, uh, and David for that kind introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and Start my slideshow and then I'll have to just swap the display. Okay, so I think that probably looks okay. Please let me know if you're not seeing my presentation at full size. So it is um, a real pleasure to be able to join all of you here um, on Zoom. And Sister Rosine, thank you for your persistence and continuing the, uh, the SAVE um, lectures through the pandemic. Um, it's great to share this kind of community. And I really like the name of your organization, the Science Alliance for Valuing the Environment. Um, a lot of good in that. And, uh, um, and, and certainly um, the description of, of uh, valuing nature um, is strongly shared by me um, along with probably all of us. So um, I am a professor of physics at the University of Toledo, um, and I also have had the, uh, the pleasure of helping to start a nonprofit organization here locally called Glass City Community Solar, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, the, uh, the, the Glass City Community Solar logo is on the left here, and then the University of Toledo um, is home to the Wright Center for Photovoltaics Innovation and Commercialization. Uh, the short name for that is PVIC. And um, we consist now of um, a, pretty good, a pretty good sized team working on uh, solar energy conversion. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that certainly because um, photovoltaics, uh, photo meaning light and voltaic meaning electricity uh, is, um, is exactly what the title of this uh, talk is about, generating electricity from sunlight. Um, my email address is here at the bottom and it's, um, it's again on the conclusion slide. And um, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and start by showing you a picture of the solar array that's in front of um, our research building where most of our labs are at the University of Toledo. And I'm not gonna take a long time to talk about this now because as you can see from the text below, there's a lot of um, uh, you know, kind of uh, solar lingo and so forth. But what you see in the picture here are some elevated posts that are holding, um, they're actually four rows. It's a little bit tricky to see the last row, but four rows of solar panels. And um, the earliest ones were installed in about 2007. Well, it says 2005, actually. So I think they were turned on in 2006. And the other two rows were installed in the summer of 2014. Um, there was a big change in the performance from 2005 to 2014. Um, 
these solar arrays are tilted at an angle of 35 degrees. Um, zero degrees would be like flat on the ground facing straight up. Um, these are tilted 35 degrees. And if you were standing right in front of the array facing it, um, south would be directly at your back. So um, this array faces straight south. Um, okay, so I just wanna point out the title here. This is a 31.86 KW um, DC array. So um, KW stands for kilowatt, which is 1000 watts of power. Um, so there's 31.8 thousand watts of power. And then the DC stands for the direct current um, that you would get from this solar array in steady sunlight. Um, most solar arrays go through something called the inversion process to generate AC or alternating current that is the same as what we use in our, um, in our homes and in our, in our businesses for the most part. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about energy and energy really is all around us. Um, uh, you have evidence of it, uh, um, you know, your computer is using energy to, to process the video and present it to you. Um, um, you're hearing the sound from your speakers, that's a form of energy as well. Um, one, of the, one of the people from history who I think about when I think about energy is uh, this gentleman I'm sure you recognize, Albert Einstein. Um, whose um, most famous equation is uh, the energy mass equivalence equation. Um, e equals mc squared, and um, m is the mass, and uh, c is the speed of light. And um, this is probably the most famous equation in physics, but it's, it's arguably not the most important to most people. That, I would say, belongs to this equation right here, which is the energy of a photon. And the energy of a photon is given by H, which is a constant aptly named after um, Max Planck. Planck. It's the Planck constant. C is the speed of light. And then you divide by the wavelength of the light, which has to do with the color of the light. Um, so uh, just a reminder, a photon is a particle of light or a quantum of light or a unit of light. Um, and, um, and so, uh, Photons are very important to solar energy, and that's why I think that this is perhaps the most important equation in physics today. So um, forms of energy uh, can be um, kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. Um, there are many examples of that in light blue here. Um, and one of those that's very important is thermal energy. Thermal energy, if you, um, if you touch a hot surface, um, you certainly feel that heat. And um, if you were to look more closely at that surface and at that object or that material, you would find that the, the atoms in that material are moving and they're moving much more than uh, a colder surface. So thermal energy is very important. Um, um, potential energy, um, examples of potential energy include chemical energy like um, is stored in the briquettes, if you happen to use that kind of barbecue grill or in natural gas, that's chemical energy. Um, nuclear energy and gravitational energy are all forms of stored energy. Sound energy is the energy that we, you know, we can hear, um, has to do with the vibrations in gases uh, and air. And then light energy, which is of course the subject of our talk today primarily, and that's the energy that our eyes can detect. Um, more scientifically, light can be referred to as radiant energy. And um, if, for example, you're close to, uh, you're close to um, a, a fire that may have um, glowing embers and you hold your hand towards the embers, you can feel the heat that's radiant energy um, primarily coming to your hand. Um, I do want to mention that thermal energy is pretty interesting because it's it is effectively the lowest form of energy in the sense that um, all other forms of energy uh, uh, tend to end up as thermal energy. So that's true for the light in your room, uh, you know, the, the motion from your fan that's moving the air, all of that energy that's being consumed, um, you know, primarily from electricity in this case, turns into heat with um, essentially 100% efficiency. 
Um, so thermal energy is, is where most energy ends up. That's the form most energy ends up. And it's difficult to convert thermal energy back to other forms of energy. Not impossible, it's just not very efficient usually. Okay, so here's a little bit of science here, um, talking about energy and power. And um, I give this, you know, this slide is presented to physics students sometimes. And, um, but I think it's useful to try to distinguish between the meanings of energy and power. And you'll see here, there's, uh, there's a column in the table labeled standard international units. So that's fancy, uh, you know, jargon for what are the official units of energy and that's the joule. Um, and for power, it's watts. So for some of us, watts is more familiar. Um, if, uh, if, you know, it seemed like it was especially familiar when there were incandescent light bulbs around um, because we all knew that, you know, if you had a 25 watt bulb versus a hundred watt bulb, there was a very big difference in the output of the power, but also in terms of the, um, the risk that you posed if you were trying to change it while it was still hot or take it out while it was still hot. So um, in everyday life, the, the best units of energy in everyday life, especially with regard to electricity, um, are kilowatt hours, and that's what you would see on your electric bill from Toledo Edison. Um, um, and you pay for the energy that you use, as I'll mention again in a minute. Um, so in this box down here is the, the formal definition for energy, which is the capacity to do work. So one example of that is that if you have, there's a cup of water on my desk, and if I'm lifting that up, I'm, I'm, I'm expending some energy to lift it up and now it has gravitational potential energy, which I will not demonstrate at this time. I will set it back down. But if I dropped it, of course, it would, um, it would um, um, move rapidly towards the, the desktop again. Um, so power is just the rate at which the work is done or the rate at which the energy is being converted or consumed. So if you think about a toaster, um, that's a good benchmark for, for um, power because um, a toaster, when it's on and its um, elements are glowing so that it can toast the bread, uses on the order of a thousand watts, which is one kilowatt, abbreviated KW. Um, if you run that toaster for an hour, you use one kilowatt hour of electrical energy, which um, costs somewhere around a dime. Um, and um, and it's the same as a 100 watt light bulb left on for 10 hours because 100 watts times 10 hours is 1000 watt hours, um, the same as one kilowatt hour of energy for a toaster. A computer, for example, might use about 50 watts. If you left it on for a year, you would multiply 50 watts times the number of hours in a year and you would come up with 438 kilowatt hours. Now that's kind of a lot of energy because for an energy efficient home um, and ours is relatively energy efficient, um, that's not too far from the average monthly bill. So um, dehumidifiers when they're on um, use about 500 watts um, plus or minus depending on what mode you're in and how big it is, but um, that can easily run the bill up very, very high if you leave the dehumidifier on all year. Okay. So um, you can think about it in terms of an electric bill, you pay for the energy that you use each month and power is the rate at which you're using energy. So power can be instantaneous. It can go up when your air conditioning is on and, and way down when it's off. Um, but you can calculate the average power, which is just the total energy divided by the total time. So when we think about energy, there is this, um, terminology in the energy world called primary energy. Primary energy refers to the form of the energy when it is first consumed or converted. And so this is primary energy consumption for, for Earth. And um, what you'll notice here is that um, oil at 33% and natural gas at 24% and coal at 28% make up most of this pie. This, is, this data is from 2016. Um, nuclear, hydro, wind and solar, and biomass all show up on here as well. So biomass might include um, people who you know, use 
um, um, wood for, for cooking and heating and so forth as well. So, um, so that's our primary energy consumption. So there's a, a lot of the energy here, oil, gas, and coal is coming from what are referred to as fossil fuels. So the title says, why do we care about energy? Well, the reason we care a lot about energy now is because energy use is driving climate change. Um, and that's a major problem um, as we all are most likely aware. Um, this, there's a lot of data on this slide and what, what this slide is showing is the, the global greenhouse gas emissions by sector. Um, and so the energy sector accounts for about three fourths of our global, global greenhouse gas emission. Um, and then if you drill down, if you drill down, if you look more closely at the energy, you'll see that there's 17 and a half percent of our energy is used in buildings, 16.2% is used in transportation. And then we have a significant fraction of energy that's used in, in industry. And so a lot of these forms of energy right here, we can imagine supplying with, um, with um, other, other methods besides burning fossil fuels like uh, wind energy and solar energy as examples. So I wanna just point out the greenhouse effect, which is, um, you know, we're, we refer to the greenhouse effect for as causing climate change. Um, it's a bit different from the, uh, the greenhouses that grow plants, which um, not only do they, um, you know, they allow sunlight in through their glass roofs, which heats up the plants and the ground, um, and the air then heats up and uh, from the warm ground. And um, what happens in a greenhouse uh, that's growing plants is that the, the air is not able to mix convectively with the rest of the atmosphere. So that warm air is physically trapped and can't, can't easily leave. Um, in this case, you know, we don't have the same exact situation, it's, um, it's related. So if you look at the sunlight coming in, um, you get a little bit of reflection off the atmosphere and you get some reflection off, the, off of Earth's surface. Those are pretty major components of sunlight energy that leave Earth. Um, but you also get warming of the Earth. And so the Earth then, as a warm body, um, it, it effectively glows, but it, it doesn't glow with visible light like a hot ember in a fire does. Um, it glows uh, at, at a lower intensity than that um, and um, gives off um, radiation at very long wavelengths in the infrared. Now, this is where the problem arises because there are gases in our atmosphere like carbon dioxide that absorb some of those wavelengths of infrared. And so once those gas molecules absorb the infrared light, they can, they do re-radiate that light in all different directions. So some of that gets re radiated to outer space, but some of it gets directed back down to earth, at which point we, we've changed the equation a little bit for how much of the sunlight um, that's incident on earth ends up um, within our, uh, you know, our, our atmosphere and, um, and within um, our soil and water. And so that's the nature of the greenhouse effect. And as we change the balance of greenhouse gases, we have slightly changed the, that amount of power that's retained. Um, and so that's the issue. So if you look at what kinds of gases cause these problems, um, carbon dioxide remains the major one, but methane, um, and while well, carbon dioxide from fossil fuels in an industry remains the major one, you can add in another 11% from forestry and other land use um, activities. Methane and nitrous oxide and then fluorinated gases are also significant. Um, so um, I wanna point out um, that there was, um, a scientist named Charles David Keeling, who started measuring the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in about 1957 or 1958. At 1958, it says right there, um, at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And he, um, he started recording the data that's shown in the lower right here. 
And um, back when he first measured the concentration of carbon dioxide, it was below 320 parts per million. And now, as you can see in the green box, it's approaching 420 parts per million. Um, so I can zoom in on that data. And one of the things you'll notice is that um, this curve is not really a straight line um, and it's not bending in the right direction. We would like this line to be bending towards flattening and then bending down ideally so that we can get back to um, an atmosphere that behaves more like it did, um, much like it did before we started burning oil and coal and natural gas. Um, there's one other thing I wanna point out here. If you look closely at this data, you'll see that there's an oscillation in the data, the red curve. And if you look at, um, so this, um, this data actually is from, the last red data point is from January, I think of 2021. And what you'll notice is that um, in the summer months, um, the atmospheric um, carbon dioxide um, starts to come down. And um, in the winter months, it starts to go back up. And that's because um, when it's, um, it's because it, the uh, uh, growth of plants that occur in the summer months um, take up carbon dioxide. And during the winter months, there's decay and it, they release carbon dioxide. And yes, you'll point out that there's a Southern hemisphere where the cycle is opposite of that. But it turns out that in the Northern Hemisphere, the Northern Hemisphere's forested areas are, are dominant over the Southern Hemisphere. So that's why we have this oscillation because the Northern Hemisphere's forested areas are impacting the CO2 on a short-term basis. But the trend is still up. Um, so if we go back for a second, um, a little bit of math, which is like science here, uh, currently, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, if you look at this uh, curve in the lower right, um, uh, is, um, is, is going up, but it's going up steeper and steeper. Um, the first step is to make this a straight line so that it's going up at a steady rate. That's step one. Um, and uh, step two would then um, be uh, to flatten it out so that it's not going up anymore. So if we can Hopefully we can do that during our lifetimes. That would be a huge accomplishment, but it's not happening yet. Um, step three, of course, would be to be able to return it back to its um, levels um, at, at or below 300 parts per million. If we look at the historic concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we can do that back for 400,000 years using ice cores. And um, what we see is that uh, um, the CO2 levels were oscillating between roughly 200 and 300 parts, parts per million. And now we're at about 420 parts per million. So we're really putting an instantaneous spike on this curve and changing the situation much more rapidly than it, would ever, than it has ever changed naturally. Um, I'm gonna pause for a, a moment here to see if anybody has any questions. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna say hello to my friend, Brad Darda, because I see him at the bottom of my display there. And if nobody has any questions, I'm gonna go on in just a moment. I've got a question. Okay, Tim. At the, at the very beginning, you mentioned uh, the four solar panels there, that it was uh, DC uh, and most, are, most of our current uh, is be using AC. Uh, why are you producing DC and is there uh, some place that that switches over to AC, alternating current? Yes, Tim, thank you very much. That's a great question. So um, the reason it's producing current is because the, um, the technology that um, the, the semiconductor solar panels um, produce <coughs> power that is proportional to the intensity of the light. And so the sunlight is not alternating or fluctuating on a short time scale. Um, and so therefore the power from the solar panels is also pretty steady on, on the shorter time scales. And um, yes, we do. We use, um, we um, connect the output from that solar array into a, uh, a device called an inverter that um, now with about 98% efficiency, power from DC to AC. That it matches our grid, and you can plug it into your solar so into your circuit panel, um, metaphorically speaking. So, yeah, some, uh, got you. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right, I'm going to continue. Um, so, I'm sorry, Randy, I accidentally muted you. You may want to unmute yourself. Okay, so I'm not sure, I'll just start over. So terawatt is a million times a million watts, um, uh, 10 to the 12, for those of you who are okay with um, expo expo exponents. Um, and uh, right now we've got 7.85 billion people on earth. Um, I still like this cartoon that um, is making the point, this was in USA Today in 2009, it's making the point that there really is no downside to striving for clean energy. Um, and so, um, and the source of the clean energy that I'm talking about is the sun, which um, that's kind of a mesmerizing image right there. Um, our own fusion reactor, 93 million miles away. I'm not able to advance my slide. Let me see here. There we go. All right, so how much energy do we need or how much power do we need? Um, if you look at the average power consumed by we, the fortunate people living in the United States, um, about 10 kilowatts. If you multiply that by the number of people on earth, you come up with a big number, 78.5 terawatts of power would be needed if everybody were to live like us. And maybe that's not what we should do. Maybe we should try to live more like other people instead. Um, if you look at the global average power per person, it's 2.4 kilowatts or about one quarter of what we um, consume here in the United States. The total power actually consumed in 2019 was about 19 terawatts throughout the year for the average power. Um, so um, I, I want you to look at this, this slide right here, which shows the sun on the left and many different um, boxes and circles here. And on the right-hand side, we have electricity. So most of our electricity, if you trace back from this lightning bolt here that represents electricity, most of it comes through this um, kinetic energy, which is um, really the motion of a turbine. And um, for the most part still, we're turning that turbine with um, um, heat, put into a boiler and that heat is coming from fossil fuels. Tiny amount from biofuels, a tiny amount from CSP, which stands for concentrating solar power, which is different than photovoltaics. Um, nuclear and geothermal, of course, are also used. Um, and so um, the interesting thing is that the mechanical energy here and the kinetic energy that allows you to run a generator, you can provide that same kind of um, drive or energy from wind or from hydro, those are driven by weather, which is driven by the sun, or by tides. Um, if you look down here at the bottom though, there's this unique energy source that is based on photovoltaics that takes sunlight directly to electricity without any mechanical motion or kinetic energy other than um, the uh, microscopic processes that are taking place in the semiconductor materials. Um, and so, um, you know, how much energy do we need? Um, well, we talked about that already, but um, if you look at uh, sources of energy, um, on the left here is um, the amount of um, power available from various sources. So, wind on the, on the range of 25 to 75 terawatts. That's if we were to use it to its maximum. Um, hydro, just three to four terawatts. Um, tides and waves, much less than that. Um, world consumption is now 19 terawatts, but the sun brings 23,000 terawatts to, to earth. Um, so that's a huge, huge potential in sunlight. Um, if you look at our total reserves, uh, you know, we've got 215 terawatt years of, of gas and, and so forth from these other sources right here. Now, three of those four are obviously problematic, and I don't have a slide in here to talk about nuclear energy, but nuclear energy um, is um, enormously difficult. And my evidence for that is that the last time 
the United States built a nuclear power plant was 40, at least 40 years ago. And there have been uh, at least a couple cases um, where nuclear power plants have been started and abandoned. And um, it happened at Marble Hill in Indiana. And there's this great picture that I wish I had right now that shows, um, that shows uh, the reactor towers being, uh, being destroyed, basically, uh, taken down. They spent $2.5 billion um, that probably came from consumers and ratepayers, um, and uh, then they realized it was going to be too expensive, so they stopped and, and then just took it apart. And that same thing happened recently in Georgia. I think there are two in the southeast that started construction, and way over budget. One of them I think is still, you know, still has potential and the other one has been abandoned. Um, okay, so the sun, it is a fusion reactor. Um, that's, um, that's the source of its energy. And it is giving off radiant energy that transfers through space. Um, and I just saw this slide about a week ago from Joel Jean of Swift Solar. Um, their company is trying to make a new kind of solar panel. Um, what's shown here are solar panels kind of um, in, in space next to Earth. Um, that's, that's not really what um, is intended here, but um, um, even by him, but uh, this wireless power transfer is happening all the time from the sun to the Earth. And that's, sun, that's what we see as, um, as sunlight. Okay. So, this is the solar radiation spectrum, so a bit more science here. And um, what you see on the vertical axis is called spectral irradiance. And it's really just the amount of power in the sunlight um, per unit area. So this meter squared is about one yard squared for those of you who are more familiar with feet and yards than you are with meters. Um, and then this per nanometer just means if you have a uh, a one nanometer sliver of the of the spectrum. That's how much power is contained there. So um, we have um, the yellow curve is sunlight at the top of the atmosphere, and the red curve is the sunlight when it reaches the surface of the Earth. And you'll notice that it's lower than it is in outer space, or uh, you know, just above the atmosphere because of reflectance and so forth, as we discussed previously. There are also some gaps in the spectrum here from um, absorption by gas molecules in our atmosphere, um, but those really don't turn out to be very important. Um, the visible spectrum is right here between about 400 and 700 nanometers, and solar cells and solar panels work um, just a little bit on the ultraviolet side of visible, out into the infrared, out to typically not beyond, not much beyond about 1500 nanometers. You can get a little more useful energy out at longer wavelengths, but um, for the most part, we're in this region where the solar spectrum is, we're working where it's strong. Um, so I mentioned the concept of a photon, particles of light, and it, it turns out that we can, we can convert these values into a, the rate at which photons are arriving per square meter, per nanometer of bandwidth, and can see these numbers are really big, five times 10 to the 18. Um, I'm sorry, but uh, the largest name I know for exponents, so um, giga is 10 to the nine or a billion, and tera is 10 to the 12th, peta is 10 to the 15th, and I don't even know what 10 to the 18th is, um, but there's a word for it, I can tell you that. So, um, so these numbers are really big, and this green bar right here just shows the visible part of the spectrum. Now, what's interesting about the photon view is that um, every time you absorb one photon in a solar cell, you get one electron. So there's this one-to-one -one correspondence. So we do need to count photons um, in, in our line of work to understand um, how much current we're getting and, and why and, and what that means. Um, here's a map of the United States, including Hawaii and Alaska. And um, what this is, is um, it's a measure of how much solar energy we get, depending on where we are in the country. And it's averaged over the full year. And it's basically, um, it's for 
um, a solar panel that's pointed um, optimally towards the sun. And you can see, so we're over here in Toledo, this kind of light green, so we're around 4.0. And that measure is kilowatt hours of sunlight energy per square meter per day. So that's an average. And on a sunny day in Toledo, the best days will be um, well above seven kilowatt hours per square meter per day. And then we have some days where we're below one. Um, but you can see, of course, the southwestern United States is a, uh, a hot spot for solar energy. And Alaska, not so much. But um, when you look at Alaska and compare it to Germany, Germany has a lot of solar installed. Germany is more like Alaska than it is like um, Arizona. So, OK. Um, you know, the. There are a couple stars on the map here. One's for Toledo, Ohio, and one's for Golden, Colorado, where I used to work at the National Renewable Energy Lab. And so you can see they're different by 25%. So they have an advantage over Toledo when it comes to capturing um, um, energy from solar panels and solar arrays. Um, that doesn't mean it's not a good idea here. And it doesn't mean that you can't make it pay. Okay, so this is a simplistic introduction to a solar cell. Um, we know that um, solar cells need to absorb sunlight um, efficiently, because if you don't absorb the sunlight, then you can't convert it into electricity. Um, every photon that's absorbed generates one electron, and you can see in this zoomed photo here that the photons come in, they generate electrons, and um, a positively charged um, conceptual particle called a hole. And um, a, a solar cell then will separate these and send electrons out only one side um, and holes out the other side. And uh, that represents a current. And so when you shine light on a solar cell, you will get a current and a voltage. And um, it's not in my talk, but it should be. Well, it's in here verbally. And that is that Power equals current times voltage, so you need both. And so it really does act like a battery when the sun is shining on it. Um, I'm gonna go quickly through this because I think, um, I think I'm think i probably not, um, so it's 8.15, so I'm halfway through um, the, time, the time allotted and I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for discussion. So I'm gonna just um, say that um, these are some ways that we commonly look at how solar cells perform. Um, one is the current versus voltage curve, which is this red curve here on the top. Um, and there are some special points on this curve that are pointed out, but um, this MPP is, stands for the maximum power point, And that's where you want the solar cell to operate. And fortunately with electronics, we can control where it operates. Um, this graph in the lower left here is showing what's called the um, quantum efficiency or external quantum efficiency. And that's really the ratio. So um, this is not really simplified here, but it's the ratio of electrons collected as current divided by the number of photons um, incident. And you can see it's measured as a function of the color of the light. So um, ultimately at long wavelengths, you're solar cells will stop absorbing light because there's just not enough energy in the photon for it to be absorbed. And at shorter wavelengths, other problems happen, like the ultraviolet light starts to become absorbed by the, the top glass or some other layer of the solar cell, um, and it doesn't reach the key semiconductor layer. So those are some important measures of solar cell characterization. Um, I do have some information about how dramatically um, we have grown our um, manufacturing of photovoltaics, but this slide just talks about uh, solar cells that were developed in the 1950s, and they had a conversion efficiency of about 6%, which is really not bad, um, but it really was a very highly specialized field, and um, it took um, several more decades before it really started to get traction and there was more widespread research and development and efforts to, you know, to introduce this um, commercially. Um, let's see, this is a solar, small solar panel from 1979. And 
This is on display in the lobby of one of the research buildings at the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, next, um, I was gonna try to do this live, but fortunately um, uh, my wife Maria recorded this. So I'm gonna show you a demonstration of a small solar panel. So here we go. I think. I'm going to show you a demonstration of a solar cell and how it can be used to generate other forms of energy. Um, what we have here is a halogen light. So that's our simulated sunshine, if you will. Um, we have a, a silicon solar panel that's about six inches square, um, probably made in China, like a lot of solar panels are. So we can talk about that. Um, it has an electrical lead coming off with a convenient power jack that we can plug into either um, alligator clips or um, this uh, cable right here that leads over here to a pump, a little pump that's in a bucket of water. So we'll see if we can get the pump to go. Okay, so in addition, we also have um, a multimeter that you might use if you wanted to test the voltage um, uh, of something of like a battery, for example. So I'm gonna turn that on and then let's set it to 20 volts maximum uh, voltage. And I'm going to go ahead and hook up these alligator clips here to the solar panel. And I'm going to hook up um, positive to positive and negative to negative. And we'll see if the uh, polarity is, is what we expect. So I'm almost ready for that. Let's find that here. And they're not touching each other. Okay, so we can see there's a little black backlight here. We can see 2.8 volts, okay? And if I cover up the solar panel, then um, the voltage drops a little bit, but it turns out that the solar panel is actually very sensitive to room light and uh, will show a voltage even in very, very dim lighting. So it's a very sensitive detector of, of light. Um, now I'm gonna go ahead and turn this lamp on. Well, before I do that, yeah, I'll turn the lamp on and um, we'll see what happens with the voltage. Okay. So the voltage, you can turn on that black light, back light again. So now it's gone up to 7.6, it's dropping a little bit. Um, and um, I'm gonna switch this meter to look at the current. So 7.3 volts roughly is where we are. And if I look at the current and switch that to the current mode, we can see we're at about 0.25. If I tip the solar panel up more directly into the simulated sunlight, we get up about uh, up above about a half an amp. So this light and this solar panel are generating about three and a half or four watts of power, electrical power. Okay, so um, at this point, I wanna show you what happens when a, when a solar cell heats up. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm just gonna take it away from the light for a moment here. And I'm gonna switch this back over to voltage because that's where we see the biggest effect from the solar panels heating up. So um, it's a little bit warm still, but I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, I'm gonna put it in the light and we're gonna watch the voltage. So it's, it's as high as 7.45. And now the solar panel is definitely warming up. And as it warms up, the voltage drops. And as it continues to warm up, the voltage will continue to drop. And I haven't moved it. Um, you can show the show over here. I'm holding it as stably as I can. And now we're down to about 7.15. And as the solar panel cools down, it would come back up if um, you know if I put it if I cool it down and put it back in the light. So solar panels work best in cold water. I mean cold water in cold air. All right, so I am going to cover up the solar panel with this one little white box here. I'm gonna switch the connector over to this um, pump that's in the bucket of water here. And um, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and um, uncover the solar panel now and see if we don't get some action here. So now we've got, we're converting energy from, it comes from the power plant, right? So we're burning, coal, natural gas, there's some nuclear mixed in, um, other forms of energy, and um, we generate electricity at the power plant. Um, that's a complicated process in and of itself. 
that electrical energy then comes through to the light. So we're forming, we're making radiant energy, just like sunlight energy here. The solar panel is then converting that to electrical energy. The electrical energy is driving a motor in a pump. So that's mechanical energy. And then it's generating kinetic energy of the water to propel it upward in this fountain. And then the water gains potential energy and falls back to the ground, or that falls back to the, to the uh, surface of the water. And then you can listen to it as well. So you can hear it splashing. So there's sound energy here as well. So ultimately all the energy that we see here is turning into heat. So, okay, that's it. Okay. Um, any questions? And I believe everybody has been asked to be unmuted or whatever. So if anybody has any questions. I've got a question, Randy. S um, can, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, so you were mentioning the total available uh, theoretical capacity, solar capacity is 23 terawatts, I believe, or some such. Yes. And so if we were able to capture that entire amount of sunlight, I mean, does that, is that everything? Does that leave the planet dark if we do that? I mean, <laughs> or is there some, is that just a, a theoretical number that uses all sort of the available um, sort of uh, usable space to, to collect solar? Um, yeah, so that, uh, um, that particular number, um, 23,000 terawatts, um, is uh, um, based on uh, the amount of energy, so there's actually um, 176,000 terawatts that um, is incident on Earth um, in all, and so that fraction is intended to be kind of the maximum possible fraction, as you alluded to. Now, I don't know the details that go into that because it's such a large number that it's, um, it's uh, you know, it's really not necessary to try to push the push the theoretical limit on how you would capture all of that. Um, because of course, um, I believe that's not leaving any um, space for agriculture and so forth. So uh, I think um, in this case, that isn't like an absolute limit that would leave the earth dark. Um, more practical limits, um, um, I talk about them a lot, but they're not really in this, in this talk. Um, um, suffice it to say that uh, with about 125 mile by 125 mile square in um, a place like Oklahoma or southeastern Colorado, we could provide all of the United States' energy needs, assuming we had the ability to convert that energy to liquid fuels or, you know, to build the distribution systems that we would need to, to distribute it. So. Um, so that gives you some measure for what we need for the United States and, and what we would really need for the US or for the world would be something like four times that if we had an efficient way to distribute that, that energy. And it may be that in the future, we have this kind of super global grid that is efficient enough that we can share energy from, you know, daytime in another country with countries that are in the dark. Um, but we're not really going that direction. We're going more towards building solar energy or store electrical energy storage capacity closer to where where we need it. And that's a you know that's a normal practical approach at this point. Thank you. Hey, Randy. Yes, Tim. Or it's David. Oh, hi, David. You have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. So I remember from class that there was a theoretical maximum efficiency for wind turbines around 50%, I think. But I don't remember if there was a maximum theoretical efficiency for solar conversion. Is there? And what is it? Yes, there is. Um, that's a very good memory you have of um, Betz's law for wind energy conversion. It's, uh, I think, 59%. Um, and um, for a solar cell, it depends on 
how complex the solar cell is, but for a, let's call it a simple single absorber solar cell, like the silicon panels that you would normally see uh, right now in the, in, you know, on a solar farm or a roadside or a rooftop, the maximum theoretical conversion efficiency is about 32 or 33%. Um, the record conversion efficiency for silicon is on the order of 26 or 27%. And it's difficult to, it's difficult to keep pushing that, that up, but um, I'll talk about how people are trying to, other strategies to develop higher efficiencies. Tim, did you have a question? Well, I did if somebody else doesn't. This is my second question. So I, I have one. Go, go ahead. Uh, can you shed some light on the appropriate thing to do in the Ohio legislature related to our Davis Bessey plant? Um, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know about this, um, uh, but maybe you do, uh, the, um, uh, the, the state house majority leader was arrested for, um, fraud or embezzlement or some inappropriate use of, of, uh, funds. Um, uh, he, he, ex well, he ex actually for bribery, I guess, cause he accepted funding from, uh, um, our power company, uh, to promote legislation that supported, um, the bailout of um, nuclear power plants in our state and um, um, at direct cost to the ratepayers and consumers. And um, at the same time, they doubled down and uh, um, uh, uh, took steps to cancel our renewable energy um, priorities that we've had in place um, for a long time here. So. Um, that's a very good question. Um, what to do about that? Uh, I think, um, you know, continue to make sure that your voice is heard with your own representatives, of course, but um, beyond that, I think that it's, um, it's, you know, urgent for the state of Ohio to become more involved in the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio, PUCO, uh, because really, um, in my opinion, they're not serving the consumer's best interests, and they're not serving the consumer's desires. They are paying much more attention to the investor-owned utilities, and that is um, that is costing us. That's costing us in terms of our ability to support a growing industry, to transition towards an industry where jobs are increasing instead of decreasing in number, and it's costing us in terms of our environment because it's slowing down our transition to cleaner energy that is in fact now um, as cheap as fossil fuel energy by many measures in many parts of the world. And um, Ohio is home to the United States' largest uh, PV manufacturer, um, First Solar, and so Ohio should get it going here and start embracing the future rather than trying to deny it. Um, unfortunately, that's not what we're seeing. So. Um, University of Toledo is working hard to do as much as we can to promote uh, the continued growth of solar energy. So um, maybe I'll just continue with my talk and tell you a little bit more about um, where we are uh, on that. So this is an example of um, a monocrystalline silicon module. It's much like the ones you would see in most of the big solar farms in the world. Uh, most rooftop arrays uh, uh, use this kind of technology also. Um, each of these wafers is about 150 to 200 microns thick. Um, they are very high efficiency. Um, uh, modules can be as high as 21 or 22 percent efficient. Um, and um, First Solar uh, is, um, uh, it was started here in Perrysburg, Ohio. Um, its headquarters are now in Tempe, Arizona, but um, um, uh, the people that matter the most to the technology are, are either here in Ohio or they are in uh, California at the California Technology Center. Uh, and um, you know, I'm really happy to know some people who work in both of those locations and to be able to work together with them on solving some of the materials and manufacturing 
challenges that um, can allow them to go to even higher efficiencies. Um, their record efficiency for a small cell is about 22.4%, I think. Their record module is about 19%, and, um, and they continue to, um, you know, to uh, expand manufacturing um, and so forth. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the first solar, well, I'll just back up for a second here. So if you look at crystalline silicon, each one of these wafers, this is a stack of wafers over here on the right, each one of these wafers is a cell. These are single crystals, so they're, this, these are sliced from a perfect single crystal pool. It's not practical to make um, cadmium telluride that same way. It's made actually with a, what's called a polycrystalline film that is deposited on very large pieces of glass up to four feet by six feet in a continuous process. So it's a very different manufacturing process. Um, if you look at their front glass, which is what the light comes through, um, they have a front contact, which is a transparent, it's transparent to light. So the light goes through into the semiconductor layer. That's where it generates electrons and holes. And then the back, um, the back layer is a back contact that is opaque, so it's not transparent. And then for, for rigidity and stability, Ability, they have a back cover glass. So you can see their total light absorbing layer is three microns. Silicon is 160 microns. And then for reference, the red blood cell and the human hair are both thicker than the cadmium telluride layer. And these products generate electricity for 25 years. The same is true for silicon. They can last a very long time. And right now they're, they're, they're working on making these last for 50 years. Um, I have this very special presentation of the, the new Series 6 manufacturing process. So I'm going to play this video now um, that was loaned to be to me by a friend. Here we go.
Yeah. Okay, I'm going to skip um, one slide there, and um, I just wanted to show for the 31.86 kilo, kilowatt array that's in front of our building, um, a couple of um, students, one undergraduate and one high school student, built this nice monitoring system. And um, this particular image is from uh, seven years ago almost, but um, this runs uh, every day. Uh, once in a while, it needs it has a little glitch and needs to be restarted. But the bottom panel shows the irradiance, which is the intensity of sunlight, and the red curve is the um, the red curve is the power from the array. Now they're on two different axes, so they can be matched up. Um, but sometimes we get snow, so the irradiance gets measured correctly, but the power is low, and so forth. So you can see exactly what's happening in terms of clouds and so forth. Um, the upper panel shows the temperature of the air, which is the white curve, and the red curve is the temperature measured at the back of the module. So these solar panels do heat up. And we know, um, you know, it says UT confirms that solar cells are more efficient at low temperatures. We have done some analysis of all of our data from many, many years, and we've um, We've measured the temperature coefficient and um, we can compare that with what is measured um, in the laboratory. Um, this is another um, first solar slide right here that shows that um, because their technology is based on cadmium telluride, um, it, um, and the way the power of the modules are defined is at 25 degrees C, which is just a, a, a warm room temperature, um, when their solar panels heat up in these um, hotter climates um, with intense uh, sunshine, and in some cases high humidity, they get more energy than the silicon modules do because the silicon um, has a, a more severe penalty under high operating temperatures. Um, this is a photograph of one of First Solar's manufacturing floors. And I just think it's remarkable that um, because the industry uh, is doubling in capacity every two and a half to three years, you have to double your manufacturing ca capacity on that time scale just to maintain your market share. So it's, a, it's an enormous effort to build factories fast enough to supply the demands. Um, so, uh, um, you know, there's a note down here at the bottom. I need to move a little more quickly because I want to make sure there's time for discussion. But, um, um, you know, these slides will be available, I guess, or the talk will be available ultimately. Um, perovskite is a new technology that was um, uh, really discovered in about 2008, 2009 um, by this gentleman right here, this Japanese uh, man, Sutumo Miyasaka. And um, I didn't really have a chance to do more than say hello to him, but um, um, this is in at a conference in Switzerland where he's talking with a couple of um, student scientists uh, um, from the lab where I was very fortunate to be um, on sabbatical. And so this guy developed perovskites and, and these guys actually and their group um, are, were doing really excellent work at making high efficiency um, cells. I'm going to skip past this. We'll have time for questions at the end. I'm actually unfortunately gonna to have to probably move pretty quickly through this, but I wanna talk about a little bit about the carbon intensity of um, you know, one home, um, our home here in Ohio. This is our electric energy use. Um, it has the yearly total down here, 4,407 kilowatt hours. Um, we also have um, um, natural gas for, for heat in our home. So we have a boiler. And um, if you look at the, electrical energy 
and the gas energy that we use and you convert them all to um, um, kilowatt hours equivalent, um, what we see here is that our average electrical power used by our house for, for everything electrical is about 500 watts. So that's on average. Um, and the energy accounting for the natural gas is a little bit more complicated because of the units that are used. Um, this uh, 100 cubic feet of gas, which has an energy content of 102,000 BTUs. And if you go through that analysis, you find out that um, our natural gas average power is equivalent to 2010 watts. So four times as high as our electrical power um, for a total power of 2.5 kilowatts. So that's our home's average power consumption. If we were to convert everything into electricity, essentially, um, we would, uh, there's some cost um, information here. Gas is actually very cheap. So we end up paying just a little more for gas than we do for our electric, even though there's a lot more energy content in it. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the, the carbon dioxide emission intensity of electricity, so how much CO2 is emitted per kilowatt hour um, of electricity, you can see how things vary. So hydro's very low impact on uh, carbon dioxide emission, um, not quite zero because of things like maintenance and, and the original construction cost. Um, coal is the worst, natural gas is not so good. Solar PV is listed here at 46 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour equivalent. So, um, so it's much better. So if we were to go entirely solar, um, we would need a pretty large solar array. We would need um, a 16.5 kilowatt array. Um, this gentleman right here, um, Herman, who's a chemistry professor at UT, uh, would like to go all, all electric. Um, he, it took him a few extra months, but he convinced our local electric utility to allow him to install a larger solar array than uh, he would need to offset his current electricity use because he had informed them that he intends to get an electric car and switch his home to electric heat. Now, I think it's going to be difficult for him to do that um, with the rooftop area that he has, but um, never say never. So... Um, okay, so if we look at what's been happening, happening globally in solar photovoltaics installations, um, this is the cumulative or the overall capacity of power that's installed. And um, what we see here is that it's growing um, at a faster, at a fast, very fast rate. So it turns out that our average annual growth is about 34% for the last 11 years and more than 125 gigawatts of PV was installed in 2020. For reference, Davis Bessey, that uh, nuclear power plant is about 0 0.9 gigawatts of power. Um, now there's an important difference, right? Because this is the power of the solar arrays when the sun is shining on them, but the sun doesn't shine in the early morning and the late evening and it doesn't shine at night. So. Therefore, we, um, we need to work with um, natural gas power plants for, for providing you know, gaps. And we also need to develop energy storage technology. Um, if you look at the same data on um, a logarithmic scale here, which um, you know, changes by factors of 10 on this y-axis, you'll see that the, the rate at which we're growing is starting to slow a little bit. And it will eventually will eventually um, you know, level off at some point in the future. We don't know exactly when. Um, with regard to wind energy, which is the, um, the blue bars here, what we see is that we're at a point now where, where solar has just surpassed wind in cumulative um, installation capacity. And that's gonna continue to, that difference is gonna continue to rise because Solar is um, more competitive um, in the marketplace than wind can be. Um, I'm gonna skip past this. Um, we're back to the um, array right here. That brings me to a slide that shows some of my colleagues, um, Rob, Mike, Yanfa, and Nick, um, um, really excellent scientists um, and uh, spectacular scientists working on making better and better solar energy technology. 
Um, one of the things, unfortunately, you'll notice um, that we have not escaped um, yet or fixed yet is um, the issue that we don't have um, enough women in this field, and there really aren't as many women in this field, um, but we at least um, are working towards bringing in um, more women scientists, and we do have women working as postdoctoral researchers and, and actually a pretty good number of women graduate students um, and undergraduates. So we're happy about that. Um, things are moving in the right direction. Um, uh, I just did a little animation that shows the University of Toledo shield with green leaves instead of yellow, but they really won't let me change that. So I can just do it unofficially here. Um, so a couple trends that I wanna point out in research and development. And one of those is bifacial modules that, that work with the smaller amount of light that comes from the ground and hits the back of the solar panel. And the other one is tandem solar cells. Um, David Gray asked about the maximum theoretical efficiency for a solar cell. Well, if you just have one type of absorber instead of two, that's about 33%. But if you go to two different absorbers where the, the first one harvests the higher energy photons in the blue and part of the green, and the lower energy that harvests the red and inf infrared, then um, you, you get to the point where you can start to use that um, energy much more efficiently. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going here past the tandem solar cells and the bifacial. Um, I'm going to just show you a little bit of the science that's happening and then we'll stop and take time for, um, for questions because we only have about 10 minutes left. So um, this just shows um, an electron, uh, scanning electron micrograph um, image, or actually this is, I guess, a TEM image um, um, of one of our solar cells. And, um, you know, some of the science that we're working on is understanding how to make this back contact to cadmium telluride, not have this downward curvature, which represents um, an electric field that's pointing in the wrong direction. Um, we just recently published a paper that um, we think shows evidence for favorable, um, what's called band bending at the back contact. So this is very exciting and actually has led to a, a record um, back illuminated cad tel efficiency of 8%. So um, we're working on moving in the right direction. Um, this is some smart grid slides that um, I'm going to have to skip past, but they'll be available in the book. Um, and we are working on smart grid technology um, based on the Voltron platform at the University of Toledo also. Um, uh, it's, it's a ways till Halloween, but I encourage you to consider these costume ideas right here. Um, so I want to tell you about Glass City Community Solar. So this is a nonprofit that was started really by um, Evan Nichols here on the right uh, bottom and um, Blaine Lusak, whose picture is not up here because he left soon after it was started, but that's not a good reason. He should still be up here. Um, we, are, we were one of 35 teams to receive seed funding from the Department of Energy, and our goal is to install solar energy that supports the low-income community. Um, we're really excited to be doing this work. We've had some, um, some recent success um, partnering with uh, these organizations here and with support from uh, the Department of Energy and the Toledo Community Foundation, um, the Left Coast Fund, and, um, and private donors as well, some of whom may be on this call uh, on this, at this talk. So um, we're really pleased to be able to do that. Um, okay, I'm going to conclude with this slide and just point out that um, our sustainability challenges include solving climate change and photovoltaics is a really important piece of that puzzle. It is the primary piece of that puzzle. Costs are declining, that will continue. Um, decarbonizing, that means replacing fossil energy with cleaner energy, um, has some upfront costs, but um, it has a long, a long uh, these are long-lived technologies and um, there's a real payback mm -hmm. in protecting our environment and providing reliable electricity. So um, I'm gonna stop there. So thank you very, very much. And I'm sorry, we don't have more time, but at least we have, I guess, eight minutes to talk and maybe we can go a little bit longer. I have two questions. Uh, what is the average life of one of these solar panels? Um, and secondly, what does one do when they have them on their roof and you have 14 inches of snow for two weeks? <laughs> um, David, thank you for the question. Um, the, uh, 
Um, the average life of one of these solar panels, so they're warranted typically now for 25 years, but I believe we will see that warranty go to 40 years with the next five years. So I think we're, we're now making solar panels that'll last for 30 years or longer. Um, um, very good question about uh, what to do about the snow. So I can just relay that my, uh, my aunt and uncle had a, a ground mount array not on the roof, but um, they would they would go out and clean this, clear the snow off of it. Um, but it's harder to do with the rooftop. The good news is that most rooftops are sloped enough so that and there's enough light that gets through that um, uh, the solar panels will naturally heat up enough to let that snow slide off. Um, and uh, that really does depend on the tilt angle of the panels. Um, we're learning that because we monitor some rooftop arrays that are on flat roofs. And uh, this has been a remarkable period of time here in our climate because we've almost lost about two weeks of you know solar energy conversion, but um, now we've got the warm up. So thank you, David. Thank you. Tim, you're muted. Tim, you're on mute still. Sorry. Back a while ago, you were talking about CSP, the concentrating solar power to give heat. Is that commonly called what they call a solar power tower? Um, it sounds about right because, um, and I don't have a photograph of this, but if you imagine a large area of land um, surrounding a central tower, there are, sorry, I'm gonna go. there are I can't years see that are, what are referred to as heliostats because they will move to keep the sunlight focused on that tower to, to, to convert the sunlight to thermal energy, to heat the molten salt that can then be used to drive a steam turbine much like the heat from coal or natural gas. I, I saw one of those, I, I took it, it was it, uh, on a trip um, out west heading toward uh, Vegas from the west heading wow. east toward uh, Las Vegas and saw a couple of them actually and just a vast array but the, I think that the, uh, the panel, the reflectors that uh, uh, reflect the sun up onto that tower yeah. are on a um, computer to track the sun so that everything is getting the maximum into that uh, boiler uh, to convert, you know, get steam to give us uh, heat, energy, electricity, uh, generate it, whatever they wanted to do with it. That's great that you saw those. Yeah, that must be really impressive to see in person. Um, yeah, that's right. For a while, the Department of Energy was, I think they still are funding that research, but it's, um, it's a little unclear um, why they like it so much, because I, my understanding is that it's not as um, affordable as photovoltaics. It may be because they can build in some natural energy storage though, because if they can store that molten salt in an insulated container and then run it at night, there's value, there's value for that, right? So I think they do have about a four hour time window of energy storage. Hmm. Thank you for that question. Andy, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I was, uh, this goes way back to the beginning of your talk when you're talking about how much the, the electric bills cost, et cetera. The people yes. that are out uh, in Texas right now were being billed like $1,000 an hour or something. And one lady's uh, energy bill was $19,000 um, for the month. Uh, what are they getting, what are they paying for? Um, well, um, um, what's happened there is that um, Texas, um, Texas is a little bit unique in the sense, they're very unique in the sense that their power grid does not make interconnection with neighboring states' power grids. And so um, when they lost a lot of their ability to generate power, uh, they, uh, they were in a situation where the demand, the normal demand for power from all of their residents exceeded their ability to supply it. 
So the, you know, the only way they could figure out how to um, accommodate this situation is to let economics run its course. And when demand greatly exceeds supply, that's going to drive the price very, very high for electrical mm -hmm. energy. And, um, and, you know, the details of that, of course, are probably going to be yeah. pretty intensely because, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's been, um, been a debacle, obviously. A disaster. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. If there's no further questions, uh, I, on behalf of everybody that was listening and uh, will listen in the future to the to the uh, recordings, uh, Randy, uh, God bless your intelligence for being able to do this. Uh, I love the idea that you're trying to work for the poor and um, for people that need it uh, the most. And um, I wish you really good luck and thank you for everything that you shared with us tonight. Thank you very much, Sister Rosine. And thank you, thank you, thank you all for attending and um, for the great questions. And you can contact me through my email if you have other questions, I'm happy to help. Mm -hmm. And we would also like to introduce the uh, the next lecture. John, if you want to say something. Sure, I'll be glad to. Uh, next month, March 16th, uh, we're going to have Dr. Arthur Dahl, uh, one-time administrator with the United Nations uh, Environmental Programs. Uh, he is going to be presenting from Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, hence, instead of our normal uh, 7.30 in the evening, uh, uh, presentation. We're going to be moving it up to two o'clock in the afternoon uh, for Art to get some sleep that night. Uh, we expect to have this uh, taped as well. So those of us that uh, may be working that will not be able to attend the live presentation at two o'clock, uh, it will be recorded and available on our on our website. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>